Okay, we're on, uh, we're on page 242 and 243. Um, we're going to have to, um, as a service to you, we're going to be a little bit selective in our selection of reading today. Um, and we're going to cut out some of the more technical parts of Hebrew grammar. As I mentioned last week, this is something that um, is very difficult to, uh, to sell. Hebrew grammar as, a, as an interesting area of study. It's, um, it ranks right up there in getting your teeth drilled at the dentist's office as something that people don't really look forward to doing. It's something that if you have to do, you'll do it, but not something that people actually look forward to. So uh, if you would like a primer on Dick Duke on Hebrew grammar. There is a primer in the back of the uh, in the back of the book. I have there are five appendices that were written in the back of the book, uh, and there, the appendices were written in order to help sort of expand on certain important topics. So appendix, I think it's D, appendix D on page six twenty seven is all about Hebrew grammar or dikduk. And it starts off at, this, at the end of the second essay, the rabbi engages in a detailed discussion of dikduk, or rules of Hebrew grammar and word structure. The study of dikduk has evolved somewhat over the centuries so that even a knowledgeable student of the Hebrew language may have difficulty in understanding some of the terminology and approaches the rabbi uses. In our translation and notes, we have used both Rabbi Yudah Levi's terminology and some modern terminology to help elucidate the text. And then we go through some rules of dictic over here. So we're not going to go that through that. Okay. Um, but the point that Rabbi Yudah Levi is trying to make is that Hebrew is a very fluid language as a spoken language. It may not conform to certain rules of poetic meter. So certain languages lend themselves more to being used for creating metered poetry. And therefore, some of the words flow better. In Hebrew, the, the words don't flow as easily if you're trying to structure uh, you know, s s uh, lines of poetry that are conformed to a specific number of syllables and accents of different syllables at different points, like iambic, pentameter. That's not always going to work with Hebrew poetry, like you find in the Tehillim and so forth. But as a spoken language, a person can control the inflection and the cadence of the spoken word through the way he lifts his voice, lowers his voice, pauses at certain places, and so forth. And he says the Hebrew language is very, very conducive to conversational communication. Okay, so, so that was the whole point. And then he goes into a discussion of the Shiva. There are two types of Shivas. One is called the Shivana, the other one is called the Shivanach, the traveling Shiva, the resting Shiva, and how these types of grammatical rules allow the words to flow off your tongue when you're communicating with another person. So we won't go into that now, but we're going to skip, therefore, to page 243, subparagraph 3, where it says, we have ample latitude to compose poetry without compromising Hebrew grammar, provided that we are careful. Now, this is, what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is referring to, is the fact that some Hebrew poetry that preceded he himself was written in a way that was imitative of Arabic poetry. Um, some say that the uh, Zemer, Doror Yikra, was, we, we mentioned that before, it was composed by one of, by, I believe it was Dunash ibn Labrat, and he was the one that felt that you had to, that it was acceptable and even laudable to imitate the Arabic style of metered poetry. And therefore that, that song itself has, came under criticism because it, it sort of, change some of the grammatical rules in order for the words to conform to the metered style of Arabic poetry. 
So he says, well, you have to be careful. That's not, that's a no-no. It's basically, he's sort of, this is a subliminal, uh, under-the-radar criticism of those poets, those Hebrew poets who have used the Hebrew language and have sort of cut corners with grammar in order to conform to the metered poetry style. But what has happened to us in our adoption of metered poetry is the same thing that happened to our ancestors about whom scripture says, and they blended with the other nations and learned from their ways. So he's essentially being critical of this. He says when you try to imitate the other nations, you end up um, uh, basically losing the special uniqueness of Ju Judaism, of Torah, and in this case of the Hebrew language. So anyway, that's his point, that's his soapbox issue. For us it doesn't resonate as strongly because we don't have this kind of struggle within uh, Jewish society today, the struggle for the Hebrew language. I, per I, I guess perhaps there have been soapbox issues uh, in earlier generations, much later than Rabbi Yehuda Levi, about Hebrew language. You know in the 19th century there was a renaissance of the study of Hebrew grammar. And this was done primarily by the maskilim, by, the, by those who were part of that uh, reformation of Judaism. And that's one of the reasons we mentioned in the past that the study of dikduk has fallen by the wayside in the 20th century and the 21st century in the more traditional day school systems because of the association that many educators made between the study of Hebrew grammar and the Haskalah, the Reformation. And of course that's a, that's a tragic casualty of the schism that formed in the 19th century because there's no reason for us to be stabbing at windmills uh, and fighting the Reformation uh, over in the issue of Hebrew language. So fortunately, there are many schools that have basically gotten over that. And he, there's teaching of Ivrit be Ivrit with plenty of dikduk. I know when I was in school in California as a little boy, I had the most amazing Israeli Hebrew speaking language teacher. And it's because of her that I was able to, uh, Mrs. Berdugo was her name. I hope she's still alive. And because she was in, in high school, and because of her, I was able to uh, gain at least the modicum that I needed in order to use that as a springboard to study Dukduk on my own. But unfortunately, I see my kids, I don't know if it's true with your kids, but my kids never had that infusion of Dukduk, of just being able to learn the basic rules of Hebrew grammar, this, the, the binyanim, the seven structures, um, how to conjugate words in all of the different structures, and of our hova and atid to be able to learn the basic rules. And it also, by the way, all of my knowledge of Hebrew grammar also helped me in my study of Arabic, which is another Semitic language, which is even more complicated. It has 10 basic binyanim, whereas Hebrew has only seven, and it's got an additional five. So, and it's a much more, uh, much more, there's much more vocabulary, but it's all the rules of conjugation in Hebrew apply in many instances to Arabic as well. So it's, I'm just saying it's chaval, chaval are kids. Chaval in Israel too. In Israel, they probably don't study dikduk either as much as they used to. It's chaval. It's such a, it's such a um, structured, very, very structured language that has its own sis, uh, all Semitic la uh, language. The, those whole group, that whole group, Ar Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, uh, they all conform to a very structured system that doesn't exist in English. And it's because English, you know, of course, it's a bastardized language compiled of many, many different languages that come before it, but Hebrew is just like, it's so pure in its structure, and it's so scientific in its structure, and it's chaval that uh, our kids have not really been infused with that knowledge. But anyway, that's it, that's what it is. Okay, so whatever you can do to change the system. There's a book, I don't know if you, if you I forget what it's called, I actually got it one minute when I was studying Hebrew in university. It's from Hebrew University in Israel, they use it here, and it's like, it's sort of long shaped, and it has every single root word, like the three, the three, the root of all the words in Hebrew language. From that, it shows you how you can go into all the tenses. So past, present, future, if, il, nif, al, whatever. Right. 
tenses and binyanim, right? Binyanim. The Zman really, and the binyan, right? It really, like, I found that that was so helpful just in understanding the language generally. Like, even if you're reading a newspaper or right. trying anything, like, if you had that, like, basis, right. you could figure out how to speak better. Right. When, Agreed. So, Agreed. I don't know why. I'm there are thinking. some good books available out there, but again, like I said, if you um, maybe one day we'll offer a dicta course, a Hebrew <laughs> language dicta course at the Mayans. Okay, so we're up to paragraph 79. So we've skipped a little bit of our text um, to help keep you awake. So in paragraph 79, the Kuzari said, in the bottom of page 243, so he says, let me ask you, do you know why Jews move back and forth when reading Hebrew? Does it perhaps have something to do with the benefits of Hebrew about which you have spoken? What is he talking about? Shuckling. Shuckling. Um, so Rav Yudha Levi is referring to the fact that shuckling, at least when this text is being written, is a unique behavior among the Jewish people. No other culture that he is aware of at the time of this writing shuckles when they study Torah or when they daven. Mm -hmm. And so what's going on? Now I want you to know, I also thought, having read all of these texts that we're going to see today, that shuckling, moving to and fro when you're learning and when you're davening, is a uniquely Jewish behavior. But then after, sometime after 9-11, I saw a video of children in a madrasa somewhere in the Middle East, I don't remember where it was, and the children in the madrasa, these Islamic little kinderlach, were also shuckling to and fro when they were reading their Quran. And maybe other texts as well, I don't know. But it could be that they learned it from the Jews that were part of their society. But at least when this is being written, is that like, what's this thing about the Jews? No one else shuckles. Why is it that Jews shuckle? The rabbi said, people have said that it is done to arouse one's energy. But I disagree and rather think that it is because of what we are discussing. Because Hebrew allows many people to read it as one, and that's the way the language is structured because there are inflection points that everyone, if they know the language, naturally gravitates towards. It was possible for 10 or more people to gather around one book. This is why many of our books were large because the books used to rest on the ground, each of the ten would have to regularly bend over to read a word and then stand erect afterwards to allow another to bend over and read. This is how moving back and forth originated. From that point onwards, it became an accepted tradition because people looked at the movements of others and wanted to emulate them, such as human nature. With peoples of other languages, however, each person reads his own book and can bring it close to his face or bring himself close to it, each according to his desire, without having to move because of his partner. He therefore has no need to move back and forth. So this is the famous Kuzari source for why people shuckle. And so the, the reason he says is, is that in the old Jewish cheder, back in, the, in, back in ancient times, there was one book that was a large book with the chumash, they would put it on the center of the classroom on the floor, or maybe slightly elevated from the floor if you didn't want to put the chumash on the floor. The children would stand around in a circle, or in a semicircle, around the chumash. And then when it was Moshele's turn to read, they'd say, okay, Moshele, now you read. And then Moshe would take a step back, and then little Arla would come and they would say, oh, uh, they didn't, probably didn't speak like that back in those days, but I'm just <laughs> imagining these little kids with the peilach, right? And then they would say, okay, now it's little Yitzel, Yitzel turn to, to lean over, and he would lean over, and, and it would, they, would, they would each complete each other's words because the inflection points of Hebrew lent themselves to multiple people being able to read one after the other because the words naturally flowed using the trup like we discussed last week. And so because you had one large book that allowed multiple people to read one right after the other, one would lean in and read his word, then the next kid would lean in and read his word, and the next kid would lean in and his, read his word. So this became the normal me method of learning 
is that you have to lean in and then lean out. Lean in and lean out. And this became how the, the Jewish shackle. Right? This was the way people started shackling is because they started, because this is the way teaching was done in the, in the old cheder. And that's why people shackle. It has nothing to do with any spiritual phenomenon. Uh, according to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, it is purely based upon the way that Hebrew flows, the language flows, that allows a group of people to be able to finish each other's sentence while reading from the same book. That's the reason for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. So this is um, one of the reasons that's brought down in many of the discussions of shuffling. But I wanted to share with you that there are other sources on this matter. Later sources, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi seems to be the earliest source that really explicitly addresses the idea of shuffling. But there are others who, who later address it, and they have a more um, spiritual explanation as to why people shuckle. And we'll also see how this translates into halacha, because the halachic authorities discuss the efficacy and whether it's desirable to shuckle or whether it's desirable to stand still over the course of prayer. So the Gemara is what some people cite as the source for shuckling, because it says in the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, it's the source number one, Tanya, Amar Rebbe Yehuda. Rebbe Yehuda taught that kach haya min hagoshel Rebbe Akiva. So what was Rebbe Akiva's custom? Keshah haya mitpalelim hatzibor, when he would daven with the congregation, haya mikatser ve'oleh. Because he was davening with the congregation, he would make his Shemona Esrei very short because he didn't want people to have to wait for him, so he davened quickly. However, mitnei tarach tzibor, but uchishahaya mitpalel beino leven atzmo, but when he would daven by himself, which means, you know, sometimes the rabbi gets to go to play hooky from Minyan and he gets to daven at home. So when Rabbi Akiva would daven by himself, so, Adam minicho bezavit zu, motzo bezavit acheret. You could, you would leave him in one corner of the room, and then by the end of Shemona Esrei, he would have been in the other end of the room. Why? Because v'chol kach lame mipnei kriyot v'yishtach abayot. Because he was constantly bowing and fervently moving his entire body. So even inadvertently, he would eventually make his way across the room through this constant bowing. Now, clearly, that's not the method that we daven in Shemon Esri, because we're taught in Shemon Esri you're not allowed to move your feet. But ho however it worked with Rebbe Akiva, he was so fervently davening, bowing in whatever he was doing, that he would end up on the other side of the room. So many of the Forshim point to this as the source for shuckling, that Rebbe Akiva was constantly bowing and moving to and fro, and that's how he ended up moving. It doesn't necessarily prove that this is shuckling. It could simply be that Rabbi Akiva bowed down at different points in his Shemona Esrei. So it doesn't really, it's not this constant to and fro, right? Has anyone seen that video of the different methods of shuckling? So a group, you saw it? A group, a group of yeshiva boys. What, can, can you find it on your phone? We'll see if we can show it at the end. Thanks. Yes. I, I hear something very nice, that we Jewish are like a candle. And the flame, you see the ah. candle of the flame. So you're gonna you're gonna learn about that in a moment. Oh. We're, we're, I have I have all the sources for you. <laughs> yeah, so I have all the sources for you. Okay. Yes. I can't even believe that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is discussing this because I mean I don't even know where to begin. The whole safer is philosophical issues, and he's yes. talking about why we shuffle. Yes, so what is the context? What is, what is the, the context Hebrew? of his discussion? The Hebrew language. Mm -hmm. But he makes the expression of the Hebrew language in different ways, and part of it is maybe yeah. that shuffling. I never thought that shuffling was anything except a personal preference in how you conduct yourself. I read that when Moshe Feinstein used to stand still like a soldier yes. while he was dubbing. That's true. That's recorded about Ruth Moshe. So that he would stand there's still. nothing to shuffling except your own personal preference. Well, that's one perspective. That's what I happen to agree with you. It's a personal preference. 
I also happen to think that, like Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says, that people associate shuckling in a, incorrectly so with fervency and kavana, and it's not, because I've seen people tend. What the last line of this of this paragraph that we saw is that people imitate other people, and we all do this. If you want to present yourself, if you want to present yourself to yourself, I'm not talking about showing off. I'm saying that you want to be the pious prayer, the person who is standing in front of God with piety. So you're going to look at the most pious person that you think you can find who's davening, and you're going to imitate that person. And that's how shuckling became contagious from one person to the other. Um, I, you know, I've joked about it before, but you know, uh, and, and when my daughter was in high school, I used to see her friends davening. And the way that pious women daven is this new phenomenon that I had never seen before when I was growing up, but it's this. <laughs> now that's, the, how did that get started? Have you seen that before? Yeah, You've yeah, never yeah, seen that? Yeah, yeah. How did that, what? That got started because one pious teacher started, <laughs> started, started doing, no, it's, it's mommish, uh, you, you, there's no way you can read no, this when it's up against the face like I see a lot of middle-aged women. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But the point is, is that we tend to imitate, we tend to imitate people that we admire, and we feel that this is the this is the image of piety and prayer, and we imitate that, even though there's nothing intrinsic about it that adds to one's piety or to adds to one's kavana. Yes. Okay. So I have a little problem with what you're saying because a person doesn't know what's in another person's heart until they see it. Let's say, for example, like. A lot of people, they don't necessarily imitate, but let's say even loudly you go to a rock concert or something like that, and they're waving their hands because they're so into it, right? So why can't you take that kind of fervor for your Shemayim and put it into a body movement where, like we're people, so we express this body movement. So I'm saying the shuffling is a real thing. It could be a real sign of, of, of wanting to connect to the Abishur. So why? make so much fun of it. No, I'm not making fun of it. I'm absolutely not making fun of it. We're in the middle of our discussion. Yeah, no, I'm and, saying and I'm, why? And I'm presenting to you Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's mm. perspective that it got started because of people seeing other what other people do and they began to imitate it. But there's nothing intrinsically of value to it. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, can, we, can we just finish our sources first? And then we'll take all of your comments later. The next source indicates that there is something intrinsic about shuckling, not like Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. The Torah in Parshas Yisro says, the chol ha'am ro'im et ha'kolot ve'et ha'lapidim, everyone at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai saw the voices and the flashes and the sound of the shofar, and they saw the mountain smoking. Vayar ha'am vayanu'u, the nation saw and trembled. So it's this trembling, that is the key word over here. So the Balaturim, the author of the Tur Shulchan Aruch, says, Vayar ha'am vayanu, source number three, Alkein mitna'aneim bishat limud ha-Torah. That is why people tremble or move their bodies at, when they are studying Torah. L'fisha ha-Torah nitna be'ema b'retet u'bezea. It's because the Torah was given with fear and trepidation and trembling and perspiration, and with all of these kinds of body movements, and therefore it is only natural for a person when he's studying Torah to recreate the Sinai experience of trembling, and that's why people shuckle when they study. For the Balaturim is very, de- very different from Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi says this is a cultural phenomenon that was parroted over generations, and Balaturim says, no, there's something intrinsically as to why people shuckle. Now notice he doesn't talk about prayer, he's only talking about Torah study, but certainly the logic applies to, to, to prayer as well. If a person is filled with fervent trepidation, the body shakes, and that's what's going on during prayer as well. Take a look at source number four from the Zohar, and we won't go through the translation, I mean the, the original Aramaic, so I just r- roughly translated it for you. So uh, the translation goes like this. 
we were walking, now this is a student of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, my Rebbe and I were once walking and the intense sun was beating down upon us. We saw a tree in the desert with water at its side and we sat under its shade. I asked him, I asked Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, why is it that no other nation sways to and fro except for the Jewish people? When they study Torah, they sway hither and yon, and this is not something that they've learned from other cultures. No one understands their practice. He said to me, you've reminded me of something lofty that unfortunately no one understands or pays any heed. He sat for a moment and cried, saying, woe is man who goes through life like an animal of the field without knowledge. In this sense, the Jewish souls are distinct and holy from all other human souls. Jewish souls are hewn from a holy candle that is burning bright, as it says, Ner Hashem Nishma Sadam, the candle of God is the soul of man. This candle, when it connects with the transcendent Torah, has its flame ignited. Once ignited, the flame constantly flickers and is never at rest even for a moment. The same is true of Israel. Once the flame of their souls is ignited by even one word of Torah, their flames cannot be at rest. This is why their bodies sway in all directions, just like the flame of a candle. And that explains the phenomenon from an intrinsically valuable source. That, in other words, there is something to the energy that is contained within the Torah that as soon as we connect with it, our bodies naturally have this desire to move. Um, next, the Shulchan Aruch. Rav Moshe Israelis' con contribution to this particular area of halacha in the laws of tefillah quotes from Rabbi David Abu Darham, who was a commentary on the Siddur. And the Ramah writes like this, that people who are meticulous have a custom of swaying, of shuckling when they recite passages from the Torah. And this is analogous to the Torah that was given and it's with trepidation, like we saw from the Balaturim. But then he adds, and also when people pray, they tend to shuckle. As it says, all of my limbs will say to you, O God, who is like thee. Meaning that when a person is praying, it's a source, it's a form of worship to God. So you worship God with your mouth, but also you want to worship God with the other portions of your body. And that's why a person who truly wants to get into prayer with all of his essence devotes himself physically by moving to and fro as a form of bodily worship that accompanies his verbal worship. That's the way the Shulchan Aruch approaches the benefits of shuckling during davening. But then, of course, you have that famous story about Rav Moshe Feinstein, who stood still like a soldier because he said that from the day, he, apparently he was on the the Eastern Front or something like that, you know, in Russia one day, and he saw a soldier in Siberia standing guard, and the fellow didn't move an iota, like one of those British uh, beef eaters or whatever they're called, you know, and they don't move, a, they don't move, they don't twitch, they don't do anything. And that is a sign of true service, of true dedication. And that, that's the reason why Rav Moshe didn't move at all. So what does Rav Moshe do with this statement of the Ramah? Is he in uh, violation of this principle of kolatz nasai tomarna? So the Mishnah Bura says in source number six as follows. He says, V'yesh poskim shecholkim alzeh. He says, there are authorities that disagree with the Ramah. V'omrim debat fila ein lehit na'anaya. And they say that during prayer, a person should not shuckle. V'rak, meaning during Shemona Esrei, a person should not shuckle. V'rak b'psukei de zimra u'birkat kriyat shema v'limud ha-Torah afilu shabal peh amin haglihit na'anea. This is only when you're davening p'sukei de zimra, saying the blessings of kriyat shema, the prefatory portions of davening before Shemona Esrei, is it appropriate to shuckle, but not during Shemona Esrei itself. And also when you're studying Torah, it's appropriate to shuckle. The Katava Magen Avraham, Uda Avid Kemar Avid, Uda Avid Kemar Avid. Magen Avraham just writes, you can do either one. Whichever one will bring you more Kavana is what you should be doing. If standing still brings you more Kavana, stand still. If bringing, if shuckling brings you more Kavana, then you should shuckle. Vahakola Fimashu Adam. Right? As, as the Mishnah Burra speaks out, it depends on the individual. In Mechaven Heteva Ayyadei Tnuayit Na'aneya, Vimlav Ya'amotach. 
ובלבד שיכוון ליבו. The most important thing is to have kavana. So whatever physical behavior while you're saying the words gives you the most kavana is what you should do. וכיצד מתנעניים תנועה משובשת שהגוף עומד על עמדו רק בראש הופך פעם לימין ופעם לשמאל דרך גאווה אין לעשות כן. Finally the Mishnaburah says that there are people who stand straight and they go like this. Right, and he says that's, uh, that's arrogant. That's, uh, <laughs> that's an arrogant pose. And you, should not, and you should not do that, he says. But, of course, okay, so again, uh, uh, no one's making fun, but at the same time, we're not making fun, but at the same time, we're telling a person, don't be a copycat. Don't do it just because that's the what, don't be a follower, just do what the rest of the crowd does because it'll help you fit in culturally. Which unfortunately is what any insecure person does. And, and who is who doesn't have insecurities? You walk into a shul for the first time and you see everybody doing a certain type of practice, you want to blend in, so you do that as well. Right? You know that famous, you know, the famous story about the yeshiva bacher who comes into the yeshiva for the first time and it's a musr yeshiva and everyone's krechtsing. Oh, ich bin a gornish. This was opening with the Muster Sefer. Ich bin a gornish. Ich bin a gornish. I'm a, I'm a nobody. I'm a no that was the way that they worked on themselves, right? So he sits down, opens up his Sefer. He says, Oh, ich bin a gornish. Ich bin a gornish. Some of the, oh, one of the older boys taps him on the shoulder. He says, You're here for five minutes and already you're a gornish. <laughs> like, who do you think you are? Right. Okay, yes. Uh, what about the brachot in the Shona Esrei and Mordim and so those are, those are those are just regular bows. You're supposed to bow, you know, come to a, a 90 degree angle with your body. Shuckling is not that. Shuckling is uh, swaying to and fro. Yes. So I think it might be true that it's imitation in some sense of like I think you see a lot of little kids doing it, like they imitate their fathers or whoever. But I also think that um, <coughs> It could be like, I think that depending on the person, I look at it, it could be sort of almost like a meditational state. Like people who meditate, they go, um, um, right? They're supposed to do that, I don't meditate, but they're supposed to do that periodically while they're doing it. So it's supposed to put them in some kind of more receptive state. So right. it could be kind of like that for that person. Right, right. I'll be honest with you, I, I, I sometimes catch myself shuckling at a moment of least amount of kavana. And, I, and, I, and, and the way I catch myself is I, as I say, what are you doing? Stop shuckling and start thinking about what you're saying. So for me, it goes both ways. And then sometimes when I want to intensify my kavana, I'll find myself, my body's not moving. So for me, it's, I don't have a fast and steady rule how, how it works. For like me. with music, right? You, people do it automatically. Why do people start? They, they start swaying to the music, right? yeah. Like, it's uh -huh. like different parts, yeah. like not really. Right, please. Well, that's why I was so surprised that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is discussing this because I feel like it's just a personal preference thing. As I walk by the men learning here in the morning, I see them all stroking their beards. <laughs> <laughs> it's a personal preference, what a person does while they're studying. Um, why discuss, should we be stroking our beards or not? I've so, seen Hasidic Rebbe's twirling their payas while they're learning. Should we be twirling our payas? That's why I'm surprised that he's even okay. addressing it. I, I, so I, I want to I wanna just address that for one minute. Your, your point is well taken. Can I just guess at that? I think because yeah. he's uh, Rabbi Moshe Levy is speaking to a non-Jewish person, so there's more to explain. We already kind of know all this. Before. Well, actually, his audience is not a non-Jew. Oh, it's not. It's, okay. it's, it's, the, it's, it's the protagonist that he created. One of them is not oh. Jewish. But who is he addressing? We, we spoke about this early on in the book. His audience is the Jewish community of his time that feels a sense of inferiority to the parent culture. We've talked about this a lot in the past. Rabbi Yudha Levi feels, on the one hand, a need to explain the totality of Jewish thought, but also to try and comment on Jewish practice as well, of his time that he sees that many people do sometimes strange things that, does, that don't have an origin. So he wants to explain that even shuckling, which was probably looked upon as primitive by the parent culture, what are these Jews doing? They're swaying their bodies back and forth. What's this going on? Rabbi Yudha Levi says, it all relates back to something that is actually very 
important about the Hebrew language that is the cause for us swaying to and fro. Granted, there's nothing intrinsic about it, but he says, nonetheless, this is the reason for it, because of something important within Judaism, not because of something trivial. And that's the reason why he addresses it. Because again, the purpose of the book is to bolster, prop up Ju Ju Judaism and everything Jewish to his audience. You want to bring up the video? So what uh, um, will... We can uh, gather like they did on the book and we can help Okay, so <laughs> how big is your screen? Right, let's, we'll, take, we'll try and take a look quickly. This is a video called Davening Stereotypes. The rock, paper, scissors shout. The lumberjack. <laughs> Olympic rowing team. <laughs> the why me guy. <laughs> uh, the guy who forgets Yala Biavo. Clapper. <laughs> Aerobics. <laughs> the guy who does slot lano on Shabbos. <laughs> Guy who says Tachanun on Rosh Chodesh. Okay, you, you get the uh, you get the picture, huh?